and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I know it's been forever since I've posted and I'm a serious slacker. Thank you to Eugene who sent me an email that came through to my work inbox for getting me going on this again. I know I'm always seeming to promise it, but I really am going to make a concerted effort to get one of these out a month. I really, really am. I promise. Um, oh, okay. And one other thing before I get started is if you hear funny noises in the background, my husband is building a shed on our deck and it's Sunday afternoon. And this is really the only time I have this week to do this. So I have to do it and I have to do it while he's using a nail gun out there and an air compressor and whatever. So sorry about that. Okay. So with that out of the way, let's get on with it. I want to talk about music this episode, because that's how I first got into Renaissance history. Renaissance literally means rebirth. And the music of the time is so exciting to me because whole new harmonies were being developed. If you think about Gregorian chant, it's all just one melody. And in the Renaissance, the sacred music was dominated by polyphony, which is multiple independent harmonies that cross over and play together to make a piece of music that is exciting and interesting to listen to. This secular music is also exciting with lyrics that are filled with puns and innuendo and they tell stories that were being told musically for the first time since music was being written down. So to support this podcast, I've created both a Spotify and a YouTube playlist and I'm going to put the links on the blog at http colon slash slash englandcast.blogspot.com. And I suggest listening to the music as you listen to the podcast. And because I don't really feel like being sued anytime um, soon, I'm not going to post snippets of the music on the podcast. So I was thinking I could have it kind of interspersed, but then I thought I'd probably get sued if I did that. So I don't really feel like having that happen. So I'm not going to do that. So go to the blog, download the, um, the playlist on either Spotify or go to YouTube and listen, and you can listen along as um, you're listening to the podcast. So also one other caveat, this episode is going to focus purely on English composers. There are tons of great music out there of great Renaissance music. And two of my favorite composers are Gesualdo and Jean Bear. And if after listening to this episode, you find yourself moved to find out more about this kind of music, I would be happy to recommend some good albums. And I might actually make another playlist and put it on the blog in a separate entry um, for you to listen to, to, to explore further. But for the purposes of this podcast here, I'm just going to focus on the English composers. So first I'm going to talk about madrigals. Madrigals are kind of like pop music today. They're secular poems that are set to music, generally with three to six voice parts, mostly unaccompanied. Like most of the Renaissance, they originated in Italy, but by the late 16th century, in the reign of Elizabeth I, they had migrated to England. The first English madrigal that I sang in my high school choir was Thomas Morley's Now is the Month of May. Morley wasn't the earliest madrigal composer, but he's one of the most famous, and he was the first one I ever heard. Many school choirs will have sung his music, though they might not fully understand the lyrics. I always find it funny that people have an opinion that if something is old, it must be proper. This song is full of innuendos. The lyrics celebrate the beginning of springtime and talk about merry lads playing in the grass with bonny lasses, indulging in the sweet delights of youth. It would have been as suggestive to contemporary listeners as some of the most blatant rap songs are to us today. Thomas Morley lived from 1557 to 1602. And he studied with William Byrd, who we'll get to in a little bit. By 1589, he was the organist of St. Paul's. And in 1598, he took over the Royal Music Printing Patent that was acquired by Byrd in 1575. He published several editions of Italian madrigals, and he helped to grow the popularity of madrigals. He also edited The Triumphs of Oriana in 1601, which was a collection of madrigals from over 20 different composers celebrating the reign of Queen Elizabeth, who was referred to as Oriana. Morley wrote plenty of sacred music, but he's best remembered for some of his secular music, including about a hundred madrigals. Orlando Gibbons is another famous madrigal writer, though he's at the tail end of the English Renaissance. 
His most famous song is called The Silver Swan and was published in 1612. By the time of Gibbons, the madrigal was already falling out of fashion. It was really only in the height of fashion for like 30 years. And it was morphing into what would become cantatas and eventually opera. And many musicologists see this song as one of the last in the English choral tradition. And it's a fitting end with lyrics that are talking about death. The silver swan sang her first and last when she was dying, lamenting at the end, farewell all joys, O death, come close mine eyes. More geese than swans now live, more fools than wise. It's a very beautiful song. But let's go back to the start of the Tudors with Thomas Tallis. If you watched the Tudors on Showtime, at least in the U.S. it was on Showtime, um, you'll remember the character of Thomas Tallis. He was born around 1505, and he first appears in London around 1538-ish. Um, a lot of the early composers had worked for the monasteries, writing masses and songs for the liturgy. And so as the monasteries were being dissolved, something that we talked about in an earlier episode as Henry was shutting down the church, um, it made it difficult for composers of regular service music because a lot of them had regular posts that were then you know, being taken away from them. So Thomas seems to have bounced around until around the 1550s when he married and got, got a land grant from Mary I. Th um, Thomas Tallis's masterpiece and arguably the pinnacle of English poly polyphonic music is Spem and Allium, which translates to Hope in Any Other, written about 1570. In its original form, it is written for eight choirs of five voices each, making for 40 voice part, parts, though there's a lot of interlapping in there um, and so overlapping. And so um, you don't necessarily need 40 parts to make it happen. Um, but that's what it was originally written for. And the piece is written in Latin. And Talus was a strong Roman Catholic who managed to navigate the challenging religious waters throughout the changing monarchs of this period. If you'll remember, we were going from Catholic to Protestant to Catholic to Protestant to Elizabeth, who didn't want to have anything to do with anything, but mostly Protestant. So it was really hard for people who were Catholics at that time because it was going back and forth. Well, it was hard for Protestants, too. It was hard for everybody, really. Anyway... Um, so Talis did write some music in English though, and he wrote a song called If You Love Me, Keep My Commandments, and it's a beautiful example of early religious music that was written in English. And despite his Catholic religion, he was one of the first composers to write for the Anglican liturgy. In 1575, Queen Elizabeth gave Talis and William Byrd a royal license to publish music and their volume of Latin motets appeared later that year. And I chose one of William Byrd's to put on the playlist. And so William Byrd is really the granddaddy of English choral music. He was also a Catholic, but he did earn royal patronage, and his output was prolific. He wrote Anglican service music, Catholic service music, tons of secular pieces, including consort songs, and madrigals, though he never actually called them madrigals. Um, the music I picked from Bird to showcase his composition and versatility includes his Ave Verum Corpus. Several composers, including Mozart and Elgar, have set the Ave Verum Corpus to music, but one thing that makes Bird's special is that the text of the hymn is essentially a meditation on the Catholic belief in the physical presence of Jesus during the Holy Communion. Protestants believed that the bread and wine were symbolic, whereas Catholics at the time believed that the bread and water were literally turned into Jesus' body and blood. So setting the Ave Verum Corpus, which literally translates to Hail True Body, went against the grain of the prevailing Protestant sentiment. Um, the final bird song that I put in the playlist is a secular one. Who Made the Hob, which is essentially, um, which actually I sing on a regular basis. It's a running joke between my husband and I. A few months ago, I started singing it in the mornings and it got stuck in his head. And then I went away for a week for a weekend with my mom on a cruise. And the entire time he had the song playing in his head, but he didn't know what it was. And of course, he couldn't call me because I was on a boat. And apparently it drove him quite mad. And so now we sing it with exaggerated English accents. And it's kind of this inside joke. 
That aside, it features two shepherds having a conversation. The first asks the second, Hob, what has made him stop working and get all dreamy and fall in love and turn loopy? And Hob answers, and it's revealed that Hob is in love with a lady whose station may be too high for him, but there's nothing that our poor Hob can do. Either he loves her or he dies. He has no choice. Poor, poor Hob. Another famous Renaissance English composer is John Dolland, who was born in the 1560s and studied in Paris. He's actually more famous for his lute music, as he was a virtuoso player, but he did write several madrigals, a few of which are included in nearly every compilation of English madrigals out there. Come Again, Sweet Love Doth Now Invite is a melancholy song included in one of his four volumes of Airs for Lute and Voice. And to show how timeless the song is, I have included both an original version as well as a modern version that um, has Sting singing the song. So you can really see kind of how timeless these songs are. Even when modern singers um, sing them in a more modern style, they still come through. Um, John Farmer is another um, composer, and he isn't as well known as some of the others, but he does have a one-hit wonder under his belt, which is called Fair Phyllis I Saw Sitting All Alone. And I found one recording of the song, which is on an album full of secular and secular sacred and secular pieces and again i have to laugh because the same album has movements from masses and then a piece like this which is just about as body as they come the bodiness particularly comes out in the harmonies particularly the mixing of the shepherd wandering up and down and phyllis and the shepherd kissing and the words play around so that it sounds like phyllis and the shepherd are kissing each other up and down and up and down an intentional bit of wordplay that seems quite odd on a sacred album. But maybe that's just me being puritanical. I don't know. So this is a good start on some of the most famous composers of the English Renaissance, but it wouldn't be complete without talking about green sleeves, which may or may not have been written by Henry VIII as he was attempting to seduce his future wife, Anne Boleyn. There is significant doubt about whether he really did write it, but it wouldn't have been unheard of because he did study music as he was training to join the church before his brother Arthur died, and he is known to have played instruments and write poetry. So I like to believe that he did write it. I also like to believe in Santa Claus, so who knows? But it's a nice song. It's got a nice melody. I like it. So I think that's it right now. Thanks for listening, even though I've become so irregular. And check out the blog again to get the playlist of the songs that I was talking about today. The address is, again, http colon slash slash englandcast.blogspot.com. And email me with show ideas or questions or really anything else. I'm going to try to devote time every week to working on this podcast. And like I said, I'm going to try to get an episode out each month. I know there's a lot of people listening to it, which I think is awesome. And so I'm sorry I've been a slacker. Thank you for your continued support. And I will chat with you next time. I promise it won't be as long. All right. Thanks. Blow, northern wind, ascend, for maybe sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow. Ich hörte Bord in Bauerbricht, hat so lissam lies on sich. Mensch, cool, meiden of nicht, fair and frey to fonde. In all this world, flesh of one, bord of blood and of bond. Never yet in Ustenon, not so mad in London.